Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Jane, I'll turn it over to you to introduce, you, introduce the panelists and the discussions. Hello, everyone. So the, our goal now is to have a panel presentation that will really exemplify um, in two case examples, thinking about the constructs uh, that are um, important for implementation to succeed. And um, our first speaker will be, we, will be uh, Christine Ellenis and Bruce Christensen in presenting the case of uh, First Breath. And Christine is a manager of maternal and child health programs for Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation. And Bruce is a distinguished scientist at UW's Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. Our second case example, which will follow right after the first, will be from Yao Liu, assistant professor in ophthalmology and visual sciences, talking about advancing teleophthalmology using the Niatex model. Um, we'll follow this with opportunity for uh, questions from the panelists and our discussants. Our discussants are Laura Damschroeder and Byron Powell. Byron, you'll be hearing a more complete introduction tomorrow, but Byron is assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm sure familiar to many of you for his excellent work in, uh, on ERIC strategies. Um, so we look forward to this case presentation and uh, we will be starting. Um, Christine, will you be starting or is it Bruce? I will be starting. We just need a minute to pull up our slides. Great. But as that is happening, I can get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the nice intro and for the opportunity to share our work with all of you. Um, Dr. Christensen and I will be co-presenting a case study in First Breath, which, if you're not familiar, is a statewide tobacco treatment program for pregnant and postpartum women right here in Wisconsin. So in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll attempt to share a few highlights about the efforts taken to expand and adapt the program using elements of CFER um, really over the last 20 years, but we'll kind of focus on um, a part where we transition to a new model. So I'll give a minute for the slides to pull up. And if not, I can pull them up as well. And just a reminder that um, be sure to use for all of the attendees, be sure to use Menti to um, add in your questions as we go along. And there will be plenty of time for question and answer. Are the slides up yet? Bruce, we're viewing your screen now and we can see the slides. Um, you might want to put there it you. in. That's that should do it. Yep. And you can go ahead to the next slide then, Bruce. All right. Thank you. All right. So We uh, will be presenting our case study really from two lenses. First, I'll lay the foundation by discussing how the First Breath program has sustained and adapted, as I said, over the last two decades. I'll speak in broader terms and from the perspective of program development and implementation. And then Dr. Christensen will frame this work from an implementation science point of view and discuss how the specific domains of CIVR were applied to this work. And then the next slide. So I'll start with a really brief background on First Breath. Um, in its 20 year history, First Breath has worked with over 22,000 pregnant and postpartum tobacco users. First Breath is managed by the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation, which is a statewide women's health nonprofit here in Wisconsin, but really operates with three sets of key players. First, we have a network of who we call First Breath providers, and these are volunteer health and social service providers at OBGYN clinics, WIC sites, prenatal care coordination programs, HMOs, and local health departments. And we partner with them and train them to address tobacco with their pregnant patients as part of existing prenatal care. Although, as you'll see, their role has changed over the last few years. Next, in that middle box, we have our First Breath Quick Coaches, and these individuals are employees of the foundation, and they are the ones responsible for providing one-on-one -on -one tobacco treatment services to pregnant and postpartum people. So they're located throughout the state and at any given time are working closely with between 50 or 100, and more, 100 or more pregnant postpartum women, as well as other family and household members who use tobacco. 
And then finally, we have the participants themselves who are the heart and soul of the program. And we have a formal participant advisory group comprised of anywhere between 50 and 75 program graduates who guide a lot of the program development and decision making. So this next slide, I apologize, it's a little busy, but it, it's our attempt to summarize how First Breath has evolved. For the first 10 years, what we'll call original First Breath, our focus was on reducing prenatal tobacco use. The tobacco intervention was carried out as part of existing prenatal care by our trained providers, and that was that first group I mentioned in the previous slide. And it was a solid program. We had 100 sites in 62 of our 72 counties, and we reached approximately 15% of all pregnant smokers in the state. However, there were challenges with the model, and they became more apparent and more urgent as the years progressed. One major challenge was that although women were, some women were successful at quitting during pregnancy, the rates of postpartum relapse were very high, and that's not unique to Wisconsin. So the original first breath consisted of three five to 10 minute brief interventions, two during pregnancy and one at the six week postpartum checkup. But we found that most women needed support way beyond that. We are also finding that participants had increasingly higher needs, such as struggling with major life stressors, poverty, housing and food insecurity, violence, mental health and substance use disorders, and more. So brief interventions, no matter how good, it just didn't cut it. And it really wasn't addressing any of the root causes of tobacco use. So in addition, the healthcare and local health department landscapes were also changing during that time. Uh, we relied really heavily on our health and social service providers, but they were increasingly saying, we just don't have the time and we don't have the staff to be able to spend on tobacco intervention. So it was during this middle stage, this kind of teal box, we'll call exploration and testing, that we began to systematically address and respond to these challenges by testing elements of a new expanded model. So during that time, we conducted focus groups, which morphed into the participant advisory groups I mentioned earlier. And we also engaged in two research projects. Our first five-year study from CMS allowed us to hire a team of quit coaches that were pictured in that last slide and provide one-on-one -on -one services outside of the clinical setting and moved that treatment into participants' homes. And the intervention lasted all the way through six months postpartum instead of six weeks. So this fundamentally changed the model from brief intervention to intensive intervention. And with this shift, we were able to lighten the load for our first breath providers. So they'd still be responsible for identifying pregnant, pregnant tobacco users, but they were no longer responsible for that intensive counseling or the data collection. We were able to follow that study up with an implementation study funded by UW ICTER, where we tested the receptivity, feasibility, and the impact of the new model. And it also gave us time to implement and work through changes to workflow and other organizational processes. And it was in this work that we really started to use CIFAR to guide this transition. And Dr. Christensen will get into that in uh, more detail in just a moment. But after about six years of testing and research projects, we launched the new expanded model in 2018. So our focus now is on reducing tobacco and postpartum relapse and also promoting long-term abstinence. So we're focusing on reducing infant and child exposure to tobacco smoke as well. And we include family and household members in our efforts. So our reach originally in kind of the peak of original first breath was 100 sites in 62 counties. And now we're over 250 sites in all 72 counties, all 11 tribes. And our reach has improved in well. At the peak of the original model, again, we were reaching about 15% of pregnant smokers and we're now up to a quarter. And that access is more equitable. So in our old model, about 30% of participants were Black, Indigenous, or people of color. And now 50% of our participants identify as BIPOC. And we count that as one of our greatest successes with all of this. So next slide. And just to wrap up my portion, I'll just kind of briefly touch on some of the themes that guided us through this process and set us up for success. And first was just recognizing the need to adapt. Having these open channels of communication allowed us to really understand the landscape was changing for healthcare providers and the needs of participants were becoming more intense too. We knew a major shift was needed and so we embraced it. And I'll even say we celebrated the changes even though it was difficult. Second was involving stakeholders from start to finish. So we've always collected feedback from participants and providers and stakeholders and funders, but in this exploration phase, we really placed them at the center of our work and involved them in a much 
more systematic, formal, and transparent way. And then the common thread, the final one, was listening to data and information. So of course that includes listening to our participants and our staff, providers, funders, but also closely tracking program data, um, using the results of our research studies, tracking the literature, and just a general awareness of the social context of our participants and others. So um, this was an ongoing process with many layers. Um, some of the changes were planned and strategic. Some happened spontaneously, but having a system and structure to capture all of this and process that meant we were continuously moving in the right direction. And of course, our work is never done between COVID-19 and racial tensions at an all-time high in some of our communities. We have to keep adapting. So now that hopefully you have an idea of the big picture of our um, first breaths evolution, I will pass it over to Dr. Christensen to explain the application of CIFR to this work. So great, thank you, Christy. I'm gonna take it from here. And she uh, said a really quick deep dive into CIFR to give you what was going on behind the scenes of the summary that Christy uh, elucidated. Uh, first of all, I'll just make a note on some of the research because we did do some DNI research uh, during that phase where we were redesigning the entire program, we were challenged by our funding sources with two questions. Uh, what we were thinking about was more intense and costly question, how do you know it'll have better outcomes than the original first breath model, which is obviously a quantitative comparative effectiveness study type of question. But they also challenged us to say, what evidence do you have that it can be implemented and sustained statewide, at least as well as the original model? which is a much more qualitative focus on implementation and sustaining. So we did a small scale study uh, that combined elements of both. Uh, and so conceptually it was somewhere between an effectiveness research and implementation research, considered a hybrid design study, and in particular a hybrid type one, where we have the primary focus on testing the new model, the clinical intervention. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to observe and gather information on the implementation and sustainability. So hybrid type one, and though not germane to this comment today, just a quick one slide. Uh, the new model outperformed the old model in a very fairly small scale study. Uh, outcome has been six month postpartum biochemically verified absence from smoking. So now by way of long term, uh, long, long winded summary, I wanna illustrate how we've used the consolidated framework see for at each phase uh, typically, we'd start with pre-implementation phase. I'm going to start with a post-implementation phase use of CIFR uh, with the understanding that this refers to the original model. Again, the model started in about 2002, so it was well-established and well-implemented uh, really long before uh, CIFR came along. Uh, as Christy alluded, uh, we hit kind of a, a crisis of implementation. Uh, here's a, a review of those. Uh, we experienced enrollment reduction. Uh, there's a quick numbers of that. Starting about 2011, uh, implementation became less effective. We just enrolled fewer and fewer women. Um, we want to investigate that, obviously. But also, uh, as Chrissy mentioned, we had a postpartum relapse rate from our outcomes, as both from our own experience and the literature. And feedback from our participants really said, you know, the behavioral counseling I'm getting is great, how to get through an urge, how to set a quit date, but I really need to have someone help me address my root causes of my smoking. I smoke when I have stress, I have uh, mental health challenges, other substance abuse, I don't have any support. Uh, I need help with these root causes if I'm going to be successful. So, uh, starting with the post implementation, looking at uh, the existing model, we did semi-structured interviews with, with our stakeholders. And here slide is simply a, an illustration of, of what our takeaways were from those structured interviews. Um, regarding the reduced implementation, uh, that is reduced enrollment, uh, we identified the key elements out of setting. We certainly weren't surprised at that because we knew our enrollment decrease wasn't located in certain geographic areas or certain types of, 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 of provider types but it was across the state. Uh, and indeed what we found uh, was that uh, during this period, there was a reduction in state aid to our counties. And so increasingly the staff we relied upon to do the counseling just didn't have the resources, the funding to do that. 
At the same time, we uh, asked about their uh, potentially new role to address postpartum needs uh, and to address root causes of smoking. And here, some of the most relevant constructs from CIFR uh, was the intervention characteristics. Uh, we were actually proposing a much more complex model than before. Uh, also fit with the inner setting. Uh, we were asking to do, have them do more at a time when they had actually less resources. And then finally, the self-efficacy, a characteristic of the individuals, uh, their confidence that they could actually help address the root causes of their smoking in the time they had available. And they were not set up to do much work postpartum. Our conclusion was thumbs down. Uh, we simply at that point uh, made a huge change, essentially changing our service sites from having the counseling done at typically public health departments to having the counseling done by dedicated counselors at Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation. So the role of the inner setting clinicians went from one of counseling to identifying, recruiting, and making referrals into the program. So pre uh see for use uh, in terms of a hybrid type one study. We there conducted semi-structured interview stakeholders about their new role uh, uh, in terms of not doing the counseling, but doing the referrals and uh, identification. Uh, looking for, again, for bearers and facilitators, would this go well or not? Uh, key constructs was the intervention complexity uh, compared to the other model, it was less complex. Uh, it was much more compatible now with, particularly with the, the declining resources. And the self-efficacy uh, for the new model was greater than the old model. Uh, so here's some examples of quotes. Uh, for example, the third one down, it takes less time and relieves some of the already heavy workload when you have uh, so many job duties to juggle. Uh, in, uh, uh, identifying complexity. Uh, also self-efficacy, the last one, from a paperwork standpoint, it's been easier on me as a coordinator from the nurses. I've heard that it's nice to bring the topic up, offer support, believe the hardcore counseling to the professionals. So again, a greater self-efficacy for the new role versus the old role. And my last uh, implementation phase is now that we've implemented, we continue to collect data. I have, uh, amongst all the CIFR activities we're doing, I've just picked one here. Um, uh, we conduct a participant experience survey. We invite all participants to reflect back on their experience. We're using this as a primary way of, of checking out our constructs and our conceptual uh, change model. In particular, uh, are we addressing the core drivers of smoking? Uh, are we doing enough to deal to devise a new coping strategy for stress to uh, increase support for quitting, uh, addressing uh, comorbidities, etc. And I will use that as just one uh, uh, way of underscoring um, Laura's comments from this morning, uh, from our perspective, it's important to bring uh, the participants into the inner circle or keep them there. Uh, in our work, we've considered them really part of the, of the inner setting. Uh, I won't belabor this slide, it simply underscores and repeats what Christy said, the proof is in the pudding, uh, implementation metrics are more people enrolled now, more sites, more variety and different types of sites in the new model than the old. And with that, I'll conclude our comments. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's it's a wonderful example, Bruce and Christy, uh, Christine, how you went for the biggest problem, which was enrollment, and then really tried to understand from CIFR what are the barriers and what are the constructs that are impacting that, and then redesigned from there. We're now going to turn to Ya Liu, who will talk about the teleophthalmology, and then we will uh, move to question and answer. Yao? Are you on mute, Yao? Yes, I just unmuted. Um, and your slides, uh, you might want to put it in slideshow. Yes, just give me one second here. Okay. 
All right. <clears throat> Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our project today, uh, which has been an advancing teleophthalmology uh, using the NIATEX model. Um, these are our financial disclosures. I'll start with some background on the use of uh, teleophthalmology for diabetic eye screening, and then I'll move on to uh, some of the methods that we use, which will be the focus of our discussion today, and just briefly touch on some of our outcomes. So why is teleophthalmology so urgently needed? Uh, as some of you may know, diabetic eye disease is actually the leading cause of blindness among working age adults here in Wisconsin and throughout the country. And it really doesn't have to be that way. 90% of blindness is actually completely preventable through early detection and treatment. And we've known that for over 50 years. Now, unfortunately today, only half of adults with diabetes uh, get their yearly recommended eye screening. And when we look inside an eye, uh, what we're looking for, uh, this is the normal back of the eye or retina. Um, this is the optic nerve, the blood vessels. And when you have uh, advanced diabetic eye disease, you get abnormal um, blood vessel formation, <clears throat> um, bleeding and uh, inflammation that can ultimately lead to irreversible blindness from retinal detachments. Uh, anyone who's ever had a dilated eye exam, which is the traditional way in which diabetic eye screening is performed, can understand why a lot of patients avoid this. Uh, patients will need to have their eyes dilated, and that can be uncomfortable. It can uh, lead people to not be able to read, drive, or go back to work for several hours. And obviously, it requires a separate appointment with an eye doctor, uh, which can be costly and time consuming. So what we need is a more uh, uh, efficient, convenient, and effective way to get people screened. And teleophthalmology does all of those things. It's an evidence-based form of diabetic eye screening that's been well validated in the VA health system and has been implemented nationwide in England where for the first time in 50 years, diabetes is no longer the leading cause of blindness as a, uh, as a result of their uh, nationwide rollout. So how does this program work? Um, and with our partners at Mile Bluff Medical Center, um, typically uh, a patient would be seeing their primary care provider for their regular checkup, get their diabetes medications uh, refilled, check their A1C, they can be identified as being due for diabetic eye screening. Uh, photos uh, are then taken in the same building um, at that same visit very quickly, uh, usually less than five or 10 minutes using a camera that does autofocus and uh, auto capture. The images can then be sent uh, securely to specialists, for example, here in Madison, and a report can be sent back to the patient and the provider uh, within a few days um, very rapidly, and any patients needing further care in person or treatment can be more rapidly identified. Uh, so if these programs are so wonderful and effective, why don't we see them everywhere? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, clinics will invest incredible amounts of time, resources, uh, financial resources to purchase the equipment, and yet the cameras will just gather dust in the closet. And this was borne out uh, in this uh, randomized controlled trial um, in which uh, they found initial improvements in screening rates uh, in, with, for patients who were offered teleophthalmology, um, but that wasn't sustained after just 18 months. And screening rates never exceeded 55%, even though this technology was offered to patients in both arms at no cost. So our research has been into how do we sustain the effectiveness uh, in increasing diabetic eye screening rates using teleophthalmology in uh, particularly rural uh, multi-payer US primary care clinics? And can an implementation program sustain screening rates to achieve a goal of 70% uh, or greater, which would put a health system uh, at the 90th percentile? So this is a pretty lofty goal. Um, and so in our study, we started by um, doing uh, qualitative work, uh, conducting semi-structured interviews with patients and providers to identify what are the barriers and facilitators to using this technology. And then we developed and tested a program to uh, increase uh, its use in a rural primary care uh, setting. So our partner has been the Mile Bluff Medical Center. They uh, are a small health system with about 2000 patients with diabetes located about an hour north here of Madison. When we started this program, they were ranked near the bottom of all counties in Wisconsin based on national health and socioeconomic factors. We put a camera in the main clinic building and partnered with local eye doctors to provide care for patients who are identified as needing um, further treatment. Uh, in terms of our study design, um, we started uh, by offering teleophthalmology to all of the um, clinics. So there was one main clinic and four outreach clinics uh, within this health system. And uh, in 2017, we started um, using uh, 
using our qualitative work, we developed an implementation program that uh, called EyeSight, or Implementation to Sustain Impact in Teleophthalmology, and we started testing that at the main clinic, and we've subsequently uh, started testing that in 2019 at the outreach clinics. And our goal has been to measure the effect of this program through the change in screening rates over time. The results of our qualitative work showed several barriers to implementation, and these are very similar to uh, any type of primary care-based screening program, whether that be breast cancer th screening through mammography or colon cancer screening or depression screening. So these are very similar barriers to what we typically would see. Um, and then we then recruited volunteers, primary care providers and staff to participate in a local implementation team to develop and test strategies to overcome these barriers. Uh, the frameworks we used, we used quite a variety. Um, so in terms of the actual strategies that we tested, we used the uh, ERIC framework to name and define those strategies. Uh, the process framework we used, which is what I'll focus on today, is the NIATEX model, which uh, has been developed by systems engineers for healthcare process improvement. And we also used as our evaluation framework, REAIM. Uh, you'll note that we did not have a determinants framework. Um, we are using the IPARIS model in our upcoming uh, study. So in terms of uh, the issue that has been raised earlier um, by so many wonderful questions, how do you actually go about choosing which implementation strategies to use and test? Um, and who does that? Um, and uh, what does that process look like? And so the NIATEX model actually provides a really nice practical 10-step um, process with several important tools that help guide this local implementation team to actually choose for the unique needs and resources of that particular clinic, what they think would work best. And you'll see that embedded within these 10 steps are several important strategies um, as uh, named within the ERIC framework. We then applied these steps to our particular project, teleophthalmology. Um, this is a busy slide and we're not meant to walk through every single one of these, but I'm, uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, how we did this. Um, in terms of what our program looks like, um, so it's a series of meetings uh, with a coach, uh, a quality improvement coach or facilitator who works with each primary care clinic. It starts with an introductory webinar that gives them background about why this project is so important, uh, the need in the community, and invites uh, folks to participate in the change team. There are a series of two sessions, um, which normally would be in person, but now are conducted virtually, uh, where uh, participants are asked to help identify top barriers and then uh, develop top strategies to overcome those barriers based on those that they feel would have the highest impact and would be most feasible. Um, there's then a series of monthly teleconferences where the coach then helps this team develop and test uh, ideas to increase screening. Um, and you can see here, our big aim was to increase screening rates to 70%, and that would be achieved by, by uh, imaging a certain number of patients per quarter. I should also mention that these were clinical stakeholders. These are primary care providers, uh, patient care staff, such as medical assistants and clinic administrators involved in quality, electronic health record, uh, and information technology. We also had a patient stakeholder group, which um, I haven't really described in this set, slide set, um, but they were really instrumental in helping to further refine a lot of the patient facing strategies that were uh, identified. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of some of our results. Um, so teleophthalmology use uh, increased over time. You can see that the program was underutilized um, prior to implementation of our program uh, with fewer than uh, 20 patients imaged per quarter initially. When we started working at the main clinic, which is represented in blue, you can see that there was a big uptick in terms of uh, screening and teleophthalmology use at the main clinic. And then subsequently in 2019, when we started working with the outreach clinics, we've actually um, had a pretty significant increase at the outreach clinics now, which has actually uh, achieved parity with the main clinic, um, despite the slight drop um, due to COVID-19 in quarter two of this year. Um, so the, in terms of screening rates, um, the dashed line here represents the national average among um, uh, health systems participating in uh, HEDIS measures. And uh, you can see that at baseline, this health system was performing just below the national average. Uh, after teleophthalmology was introduced, we got up to about 60%, and that has been sustained um, and starting to um, slowly increase now as we work with uh, the, uh, both the main and outreach sites 
um, and we've been able to achieve this successful increase in screening rates over uh, several years now. So in conclusion, um, the NITEX model, which uh, hasn't been used as often in uh, DNI work, um, actually allows us to tailor and um, uh, have a roadmap, roadmap for helping clinical stakeholders uh, as well as patient stakeholders select among uh, the strategies uh, from the ERIC framework. Um, it, was helpful in our project for sustaining increased diabetic eye screening rates. Uh, we've developed an online toolkit, which is available for download um, for free, uh, just requires a quick registration. Um, and our goal is to expand the use of this evidence-based uh, technology or teleophthalmology to reduce preventable blindness from diabetes nationally. And we've uh, submitted a grant proposal to test our project in multiple rural US health systems. And in our next step, we'll be adapting it for rural uh, underserved communities of color as well. Uh, thanks so much for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fantastic. And I'd like to just let everyone know that Yao's not really seated at the student union outside by the lake, but on a gorgeous summer day, that's what the backdrop looks like behind her. So wonderful feature of Madison. So um, we'll now move to the discussion. We have about 30 minutes for a discussion. I'd like to start out by first asking Byron and Laura if you have any questions for Christy, um, Chrissy, Bruce, or Yao. Um, I'll ask a question since we were talking about determinant frameworks earlier. Um, so we got, I think, a very clear picture of the use of the CIFR in um, Bruce and Chrissy's project, um, which was fantastic. Um, Y'all, within your project, you mentioned using iParis kind of going forward. Can you just say a little bit about how you plan to use that at this stage? Or so um, in our proposed study across um, eight rural health systems, um, we're planning on using iParis um, as our determinants framework. Um, and uh, in terms of why we chose iParis, I think for our work, uh, what it really highlights is the importance of facilitation. Um, and I think that's one of the unique aspects about the iParis model. And I think for particularly for primary care clinics, uh, having an experienced facilitator um, is really important um, in terms of guiding the clinic in an organized fashion um, in a practical way through the steps without having the actual stakeholders have to learn all of the complex um, kind of terminology that um, we're talking about today. And um, as you said earlier, uh, Laura, there's a lot of shared concepts and constructs between um, iParis and, and CIFR. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk today. Um, and I'm planning on actually incorporating more of the CIFR elements now that um, I've gotten to see more of a deeper dive into uh, what, uh, what uh, the CIFR has to offer. Um, so thank you for that. Maybe maybe a, a couple. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say maybe a, a couple questions, but but first for uh, Kristen and Bruce, um, thank you for your presentation and and really love the sort of the piece about recognizing and, and embracing the need to um, adapt the intervention. I'm curious, you know, in the field now there there are sort of you know systematic sort of process based models for adaptation, and then the, you know as as Laura alluded to, there's there's think there are things like the frame that are used to, you know, document adaptations as you go, um, and it, it may be that you took a more sort of pragmatic approach to the adaptation process, um, which may be my sense. But I'm I'm kind of wondering, would you have benefited from a, a model like that in terms of guiding the the process of adaptation? And then I guess the second part of that is how did you sort of document adaptations as you um, uh, as you went on in the project? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, I think we would have benefited from a more um, 
a structured um, frame to work from. Um, a lot of what we did was just based on need and at times putting out fires. Um, and a lot of what we were doing was driven by funding. So, you know, our biggest change, which was going from brief intervention to intensive intervention was because we had this funding, which was actually looking at the impact of financial incentives. It actually wasn't looking at the impact of intensive intervention. So, you know, it's, um, I think we were very opportunistic, but I think had we had that frame from the very beginning, it, it I think it would, would have been more efficient in some of our work. I don't want to say we were spinning our wheels because there was always lessons learned, but I think it would have kept us more in the, the straight and narrow rather than just responding to things as they came up. Okay, Bruce, you're on mute if you'd like to unmute. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I would just like quickly to add, so far we've taken kind of a whole systems wide approach. So I think of uh, what you mentioned would be very useful when we look at, begin to look at our different sites and the referral patterns over time to begin to document how they've adapted, not adapted, to identify the, you know, the, the high performers and the ones we need to work more closely with. Uh, so I think going forward, that'll be very useful. And I didn't answer the second part of your question about how we documented. So um, our documentation really was um, any major change that we made, um, we had sort of what we called a mini report and it needed to make sense to our funders, <laughs> our stakeholders, our academic partners and the first breath providers as well. So um, that was a writing challenge for sure, but we tried to really make sure we're being very transparent and intentional about sharing every step of the way with everyone that, that was involved. So they understood where we were going and they were tracking with us um, every step of the way. So. I wanted to build on that um, question a little bit and going back to the original question that Laura had asked me um, in terms of adaptation and trying to identify your core elements. So I think one of the real benefits of using the determinants framework is when you have multiple sites and you can actually quantify, uh, as Laura mentioned her talk, um, not only the presence or absence of various qualities, but also their relative strength. So having you know a minus two to a plus two scale. And in addition to using the Pearson correlation um, that was shown earlier, um, we also are planning on using in our future study configurational comparative methods um, with our um, consultant, uh, Edward Meesh, um, where you can actually do um, uh, some quantitative work from the qualitative data, um, even with small ends, um, which we often have when we're looking at the health system level. Uh, not everyone has the ability to see as many sites as at the VA um, and get everybody on board. And so there are a lot of um, really nice mixtures of different um, types of quantitative and qualitative um, models uh, to help identify what are the key ingredients or what's the secret sauce and what combination of ingredients um, can be uh, really helpful for success. Yao, could you just repeat what method you just mentioned that was from someone in the chat? Yes, yeah, so um, it's a general um, area uh, called configurational comparative methods or I believe quantitative comparative, uh, comparative methods. Yeah, okay. And um, it's been used mostly, I think, in like government and economics research. Um, but basically it's a type of Boolean method where it's sort of like if, if A is present and B is present, but C is absent, you get the result you want. But let's say you have A, not B, but if you have D, it still will work. So it helps you not only identify, you know, different, particular elements, but also combinations of elements that work synergistically to lead to your result. Um, because as we all know, um, every single um, environment has its strengths and weaknesses and figuring out, you know, what are the combinations that work or what are the, you know, necessary or sufficient, you know, um, conditions can be very helpful. Great, thank you. I wanna see now if uh, Bruce and Chrissy have any questions for Byron and Laura. Yeah, I have one. Again, given our context in first breath, we faced a kind of a crisis in implementation. Uh, but uh, other than that, which re required us to make changes, 
other than that, I'd be curious about your thoughts about using uh, implementation science in general, but also uh, frameworks in particular uh, to uh, for quality or to to improve implementation in well-established programs that may have been existed for a long time and are are being successful, but are still leaving. Uh, potential on the table, so to speak. So have you given thoughts how you could use this over time? Yeah, I guess um, I, I have thoughts about that. I have opinions about that. First of all, um, I think that the, the dynamic sustainability framework that was published by uh, David Chambers, uh, Kurt Stenge and Russ Glasgow um, actually provides a great high level framework. Um, there's not a lot of definition within it, but at the heart of it is the importance of engaging teams in sustained, continued optimization of programs. So um, I, my own thinking, um, I've started to kind of evolve forward into thinking about um, a lot of the implementation work that we have really focused on within the implementation science world is um, focused on what in quality improvement or you know quality engineering we might call first order change. So there's a big program, you know, whether it's first breath or teleophthalmology, it's a new program that takes a lot of project management effort and you know, facilitation, I'm using project manager in a very specific way um, in that there are steps that need to be accomplished. And, you know, Byron and I both talk about the importance of understanding context and tailoring components to context or adapting and then choosing implementation strategies for that first big, and I'm gonna call it spotlighted effort to get the program up and going. But then to keep it going, teams at the front line or within those settings need to continually optimize. And what does that take? It takes, you know, kind of cycles of systems, re systems redesigned, uh, plan, do, study, act cycles, incremental change, just constantly monitoring and uh, uh, identifying the gaps where there are you know, uh, if there's a decrement in referrals and doing root cause analysis, what's going on, diagnosing that, and then identifying new strategies, um, whether it's redesign or whether it's other strategies, education strategies, engagement strategies, um, whether it's within the system or among patients, um, but properly diagnosing that. And then always continuously, I mean, this sounds impossible, but as health systems, we really need to get to the point where I think our clinicians are engaged in this optimization or it really kind of starts to slide into QI or quality improvement in an ongoing way as a part of their everyday work. Um, there are so many pressures against people doing that so that when the spotlight goes away, you know, when the spotlight is on, it's like, oh, we're going to get first breath in place. We're going to get teleophthalmology in place, you know, the screening um, functions in place. But then the spotlight moves on to, you know, opioid use, to, you know, colorectal cancer screening, to, you know, whatever all of the other competing initiatives are within, you know, clinics or within organizations. Um, and then we, you know, we lose steam and, you know, the diagnostics can start to, or diagnostic screening can start to fall off. And like you experienced with the, um, with the uh, first breath, um, I really love the way you went in and diagnosed the problem and, uh, and we're able to have the insight or the ability, I guess, to re-examine the intervention itself and, and no, you know, realizing that, wow, these payment mechanisms changed. And so we need to have a different strategy. You could call it a whole new intervention. You could call it evolution. You could call it optimization, you know, depending on what the frame is. But it was really wonderful the way that you kind of methodically went in and diagnosed that. I wanted to build on the comment about, you know, engaging clinicians in this work. Um, I think there's always this fear that, you know, well, we're putting so much on the clinicians and they're so busy already. But I think there's a good body of evidence showing that 
involving clinicians in this type of work actually reduces burnout because it allows them to sort of realize more self-efficacy in terms of improving the quality of care that ultimately is why they get up in the morning is to take better care of their patients. And so I think if you know, implementation scientists can tap into that really, really rich vein of why are people here? Why are they working for the organization? What, what are their values? Um, if you can really tie in whatever your project is to the fundamental and core beliefs of this uh, group, clinicians, uh, patient care staff, um, it really resonates. And I think that's a really important piece. Um, and then as Laura said, you know, the issue with sustained effectiveness is that you invest all this energy for this, uh, you know, sort of this large activation energy to get a program started. But then oftentimes we don't build into the day-to-day -day workflow of the staff and providers and, you know, whoever's doing the work, making it easy for them to incorporate this, you know, in a way that takes very low mental effort. And so because if you create a program that requires somebody to have to remember, oh yeah, I, I should refer them to first, this, this person to first breath, or oh yeah, I should remember to do teleophthalmology, it becomes very difficult once they get sidetracked into some other area um, that becomes the new area of focus. But if it's built into um, the tools they use in their day-to-day -day work, for example, when they're checking in any patient diabetes, if there's a, a a component of the check-in process that requires them to ask about diabetic eye screening. Each time they're checking a patient, they don't have to remember you know, to do this. Um, or if the patient handout is actually uh, always included when a patient with diabetes comes in to see their primary care doctor, it reduces the mental burden and effort for the actual person um, involved. So um, it's, it's pretty uh, important. Um, I wanted to just uh, address a question that Andy Kwanbeck posted, um, which he said that he didn't realize that um, teleophthalmology had been rolled out nationally in England. Um, and, you know, what can we learn from that? Um, well, the program in England is quite different. Um, it actually uh, is more like first breath, where there's a central um, department that actually does all of the screening. So you're, they're really just asking providers to refer patients and, and register them in this diabetes registry. And then this separate entity actually is the one that sends letters to patients saying, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Smith, uh, you will show up for your photo on this date. Um, it's free. You're going to get time off from work, you know, just do it. And even under those, what we would consider relatively ideal circumstances, their screening rates are only 80%. And in Ireland, where they have the same program, their screening rates are only 56%. So there's still a huge problem. Um, it's not perfect. Um, and so I would say that lessons from programs uh, that require referrals, uh, like First Breath, actually address many of the issues, the same issues that the folks even in um, the UK and in the VA system still have. Thank you. I just wanted to call attention to a comment from Julia in the chat that there are a number of sustainability planning tools um, that can be helpful in thinking about long-term uh, sustainability. So excellent points. I think I'd like to turn now to, uh, Felice, do you have any, um, any questions from mentee or the chat to lift up? We do. We have a lot of really interesting questions. Again, I love seeing all this engagement. Um, so there are some questions about adaptation. So when does an adaptation become a whole new intervention? Can we use frameworks to decide when we need to adapt an existing intervention? And when do we need to implement a new intervention? I don't know who uh, that should go to. I don't want to take up all the airtime, but it was just uh, the most popular question. So that's a very that's a very excellent, important question. Um, you know, within the CIFR, we talk about the idea of a core, you know, set of components versus an adaptable periphery, and I would posit that you know the so-called peripheral components of an intervention may even be ones that could be dropped without a significant effect on outcomes. But like I was saying, we don't really have good information about what are the components that are really leading toward 
uh, the benefits that we're that we're looking for. Um, and you know, there are uh, alternative study designs that can look at that, um, like doing a fractional factorial approach or smart trial designs, adaptive designs. Um, but this is, you know, way beyond the scope of what we're going to be able to cover in this workshop. But the bottom line is that it is hard to know. And I would say that if that's a key question within your domain, um, think about ways that you can design studies to get insights and to gain knowledge about what those components are. And um, Furthermore, you know, that combination of components, uh, we would say would be context dependent, or it may be. Um, and I guess the last thought that I have of, you know, when you're changing things so much, is it still the intervention, or as Jeff Curran would say, the thing, or is it a different thing? Um, and that may be in the eye of the beholder. Um, it may depend on how many other things are in that domain. So um, if it starts to cross and look like another thing that already exists, um, then maybe it's not that first thing anymore. Okay, so now I've said thing too many times, but those are all just thoughts. Thank you for lifting that up. One thing I would add to that is to think about the components I think it's really important to look at what you could drop and partly because every component presumably has a marginal return. Either it's essential or it has a marginal return, but it may not be worth the cost. So to add this extra um, push could be costly with not getting very much back. So we also have to think about that. And I think that um, the marginal returns may vary from context to context. Some people may be more incentive driven. Some people may be more um, fear driven or peer pressure driven. And so that is, I think, another important aspect of looking at the context. I, I would like to add that I think uh, uh, Laura's right, it might be in the eye of the beholder, but it's useful, I think, again, to apply some of the CIFR constructs uh, uh, to uh, to decide if it's a same intervention thing or if it's a new thing, um, and and looking at as she mentioned, uh, you know, over time the context changes. So, for example, in our example, uh, really the original model, uh, the inner setting was these counselors in public health. Now they're more in the peripheral; they're making referrals into the inner circle. So that's a huge change. Likewise, I would have argued in the original model that the core elements that needed fidelity for have to do with behavioral counseling to quit smoking. And some of the adaptable things is, well, if you've got time, you can address you know, the stress element and the need to relax and, and coping strategies. We've really changed that and brought that into a core uh, element, not a, an adaptable element. Um, I think if you look at that, you begin to say, oh, wait a minute, I think we're, we're, we now have a new thing, even that's the same body of a smoking program for low income women. We really have, have, have changed the, 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 you know, the boundaries in the program. Great. And now I'm going to direct a question um, to Dr. Liu specifically. Um, and this might be foreshadowing a little bit of tomorrow, but can you speak a little bit more about how your team actually selected the implementation strategies? Oh, sure. Um, maybe I should just go ahead and share the, um, let me try sharing here because I did go through that pretty fast. Um, so one of the things I really like about the, um, the NITEX model is it actually gives you very, very detailed um, tools to actually do the selection. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is like, okay, conceptually I understand what I need to do, but how do I actually go about doing that? And so the way the 10 steps work is um, obviously the key problem in our case is teleophthalmology use in diabetic eye screening. And what we do in that series of meetings with um, clinical stakeholders is we walk through the current workflow. So when you have a patient come in, what is the current workflow for identifying whether or not they're um, due for screening? 
and and talk to them about teleophthalmology and actually get them in, um, photographed. Um, we assemble the local implementation team. They flowchart this workflow. Um, they talk about the barriers and facilitators and strategies. Then we use this really important thing called the nominal group technique, which I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's a voting technique to reach consensus. And so we use this uh, two times. One is we uh, give everyone an opportunity in the group to share um, one barrier. And, uh, and we go in a round robin and, and until everybody has you know, exhausted all their possibilities and people can pass if they don't have another idea. And then those are all listed and then people actually stand up or uh, I guess today virtually, uh, you know, thumbs up uh, which ones they think are the top barriers. And then we actually say, okay, these are the top two or three barriers that we really wanna address in terms of which strategies we wanna implement. We then come back on a separate meeting to talk about those top strategies to address those barriers. And again, use the nominal group technique where each member of this group um, gets to offer strategies and then those are voted upon. Um, and then we talk about you know, which ones are actually implementable within the next two or three weeks. So it has to be highly actionable. Um, you know, obviously we'd all like to change public policy and financial incentives, but you know, that's probably not gonna happen within the next two weeks. Um, the other thing is the people in the actual team are very diverse. So rather than having only clinicians or only staff, it's really important to get a variety of voices and perspectives. One of the things we heard many times from our clinical partners, um, at Mile Bluff is that they'd never had clinicians, medical assistants, and administrators all in the same room working together on a project. It was always siloed. And when you get all of these people who can sh you know, share these different dimensions and perspectives on the project, it was a much richer um, set of strategies that um, were able to be developed. Thank you, that's wonderful. Felice, we probably have time for one more question. Yep. We have one more question. I'm going to have a broad one, so anyone is welcome to uh, answer it. Is there anything else we could do as implementation researchers to make frameworks easier to use during these sorts of efforts? <laughs> That's a good one. Since we just heard from uh, Bruce, Christie, and Yao, I would love to hear their thoughts based on their experiences of applying the various frameworks. Can you restate the question really quick, Felice? I, I didn't quite catch. Yes. Is there anything we can do as implementation researchers to make frameworks easier to use during these sorts of efforts? Uh, so I have a very biased opinion about this because I really struggled with this during my project is how much of the framework should I explain to the people involved that, um, and what I decided to do is I explained none of it to them because I didn't feel that they needed to know this stuff. They didn't need to know the jargon. And what we need to do is to make it as um, easy for them to participate. You know, we gave them uh, the different tools, we had a facilitator, we led them through the process, um, but I, I kind of kept a curtain um, between them and the actual day-to-day, -day, you know, of, you know, what, what exactly are we doing from a very, you know, scientific perspective, because at the end of the day, I wanted to make sure that what we were doing was meaningful to them, and what's meaningful to uh, our partners was clinical outcomes, patient care. Um, I think a lot of them uh, appreciated not having to learn uh, a whole new field to participate. So um, I, I personally don't uh, try to share too much unless somebody really is excited and wants to learn about it, um, but just try to lead them through it in as um, easy uh, and as efficient a way as possible. Yeah, and I would agree on our team, we really wanted to keep the focus primarily on our participants. Um, and some other th processes can get kind of either lost in translation or we can become a distraction from that work. Um, but that said, I think some on our team maybe felt a little impatient with the process, the processes that we were taking and some wanted us to take longer. So in that sense, it was helpful to kind of explain what we were doing and that there was strategy and steps uh, behind what we were doing. So um, yeah, I agree.
I promise I'm not paid to say this, uh, but but I would also say some of this seems very much developmental for for the field in terms of, you know, over time I think we're developing, you know, more pragmatic measures of certain constructs. Again, toolkits like you're 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 talking about um, to help us apply these frameworks. And um, one of my doctoral students the other day was actually saying like one of the reasons why the CFER gets used so much is that Laura and her team have made it really you know. Um, uh, usable by having the the technical assistance website and having qualitative coding guides and the and the like so um, even on the sort of more researcher end I think we can do a lot to make our, our frameworks more um, usable that way excellent I just want to thank all the panelists and um, discussants Laura and Byron for this great discussion it really helps to see um, sort of wrestling with these questions in action in a case example. So we're now um, going to end this session and uh, we'll have lunch break for 45 minutes. And then in the afternoon, we will have interactive breakout sessions and each one of you should have received a personal link uh, that you were sent yesterday, which is to a different Zoom, it's a different Zoom link but we'll, it will bring you into a breakout session where we will start actually doing some hands-on application of case examples and walking through CIFR uh, to understand um, the important aspects of context. So thanks again to the, uh, all the morning panelists and we'll see you after lunch.